Howdy hackers and welcome to another episode of Fairlight TV. Normally we go through rather complex stuff on the most often the C64 or there is an interview with additional content associated with that interview but uh, uh, Today we will actually go back to the very roots and to be very very honest there is a programming exercise or, or kind of the basis of programming in episode 32 but uh, I thought it would be time to uh, do a little bit of a retake on that one and uh, do assembler programming for absolute noobs. It's beneficial if you've programmed on other platforms or in other languages of course but uh, but you don't need to have to have that with you when you start this. It's going to be very, very from the very, very basic. And <clears throat> if you are very new, you might need to see it a few times for it to actually sink in. And then there will be references to additional books that I suggest that you get either as a soft copy and just read them on the computer or, or you buy them physically first hand. Uh, but... Uh, so today is going to be <laughs> programming assembler on the 64. That's it. And because this is very basic, let's do the very basic first. So what is programming in the first place? It is, well, I mean, if you're implementing something in code, you need to have like a vision of what you want to do in the end. And then you break that down into something which you can write as a line of code. <clears throat> and of course, if you have a complex program problem or, or your vision is complex, that means that you need to write more code. And also, uh, hmm, if, you're, if you're using a high level language like, I don't know, Delphi or Visual Basic or, or Rust or, or whatever is fashionable at the time, <clears throat> then every line of code will do uh, uh, a rather complex operation. Whereas if you write something in machine code, it's the very, very core of programming. So every line of code is very, very, is doing a very, very small task. So you need to write a lot of code in, in order to do something with machine code. It gives you more control, uh, but but it's more error prone. So that's why, I mean, in modern computers, everybody's writing in high level languages. You might add a bit of assembly, inline assembly to ensure that like time critical stuff is done the most efficient manner. But on the C64, we don't have the luxury of, of being able to run like high level languages. I mean, there are compilers for high level languages, but most, most efficient programs are written in pure assembler and that is basically the only like option you have <clears throat> the cpu uh, cpu in a 64 is uh, a 6510 so it's a derivative piece from the original mos 6502 and 6502 is a processor that sits in many of the 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 relevant computers of the age uh, you would have it in the apple II, you would have it i think and you would have it in the atari machines and you would have it in this one uh, the, the nintendo the original 8-bit nintendo was this as well <clears throat> the competing one was z80 or c80 if you're american um i don't know much about z80 but uh, but this one i know a bit of so that's what we're going to dig into and the difference between this one and this, the plain vanilla 6502 is that this has configured three pins to do bank swapping and and we will go through a bit of that later but uh, but the, the key takeaway from this is only that 6502 and 6510, the machine code looks 100% the same. So there is no reason to buy like a dedicated book on 6510 because a, a, a general book on 6502 would contain absolutely the same thing. Um, I'm taking this one in like a different order. So the address bus that is the CPU's 
the number of pins the CPU uses for addressing memory. And uh, this is 16 bits on 6502 or 6510, which means that it can address 65,536 bytes. Uh, that's that's a string of uh, 16 zeros up until the uh, 16 ones. Uh, that's sort of the maximum you can set when all the address line are set to one. And since every kilobyte is 1024 bytes, that means that the 65,536 is what we call 64 kilobyte. So that is the address bus and the data bus is how big chunk of memory can you fetch when you address uh, a particular area of that memory. Uh, and what you can address here is 8 bit. So it's an 8 bit computer because the data bus is 8 bit. Whereas, uh, I mean, 16 bit and 32 bits are, the, or even 64 bits are, are now the more common ones. The original ones were basically all 8 bit, and Z80 is also 8 bit. So, <clears throat> and, and those 64K, they are addresses the computer can address, and that's sort of external. But uh, in order for, for doing the operation it's supposed to do, uh, it has internal register. You can think of them like an address with a specific meaning and, and a specific name. So accumulator is the main register for doing all the operations and we will go through that. It has two like indexing registers, X and Y. Uh, so it's not always so that you want to go to a specific address, you want to go to an address plus an index, and that's what the indexes are for. There is also a status register, so if you add, um, a byte can hold 255. So if you take 200 and add 100, uh, you would need some some mechanism of marking that it there was a spillover. I, I couldn't fit this, so I have the result, but but it was actually more than than the result. It was like 255 more than the result. And that's that's one of the things. And you can compare things and if it's smaller or 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 greater, that's flagged in the in the flag register. So the status register holds a number of flags. Uh, like one bit on and off, depending on uh, the, the previous operation. And then, of course, there is a program counter. That is the internal register, 16-bit register, that keeps track of the current address that um, the CPU is addressing. Okay, so the difference here between machine code and assembler uh, it's also kind of paramount. Machine code is the binary code that is actually executed by the CPU. And that one looks like something on the right here. But, and you can write that. If you use something called a machine code monitor, uh, on the C64, most people would have some sort of cartridge and that would contain also a machine code monitor. In other computers, the machine code monitor is also built into the computer. But for the C64, we need to plug it into the back of the computer and, and evoke it by pressing a button or anything. You can disassemble, that is showing the, the binary as uh, interpreted as uh, machine code. So it's more humanly readable. Uh, so what is actually in here in the memory is 18, 80, 00, 20, 69, 10, and, and the numbers you see there. But but given that humans tend to find that quite uh, daunting to read, uh, the, the, the interpretation of, of how it looks, what it actually means, is what you see on the right. So the CLC, LDA20, ADC10, and, and all of that. Uh, and you can poke that into the memory yourself directly using a machine code monitor, and that goes absolutely fine. The issue is that it's, it's quite daunting to edit that, because if you want to insert something in the beginning or, or like in the middle of something you have written, 
you need to move everything very manually and then you need to recalculate the number of things for that to work. So what we do instead is we write a text file and then we have an assembler that helps us convert that into the machine code. But as you see in the, on the left, the, the, the instructions are exactly the same. It's, it's just that we make it more handy to edit things uh, and then like only in the secondary phase do we convert it to the binary that the computer can actually run. Right, so let's take the next one here. Uh, yeah, numbering systems. Uh, as you've seen before, uh, I marked a number of the numbers with a dollar sign, and that's because they are hexadecimal. And and I know this is confusing because you're we are all very used to counting to 10. Probably because we have 10 fingers, uh, counting to 10 is the logical thing. And we have 10 symbols and they are zero to nine. So we have a symbol for a zero, we have one for one, and, and there you go. Uh, and if you count to nine and want to state something which is bigger, we need to go back to zero and then add a one in the 10 column. So again, decimal has uh, a zero, uh, like a one column, a 10 column, a hundred column, and a thousand column, and there you go. Uh, so the position of the numbers are also relevant to, to state kind of the, the number you are trying to express. Computers, they run binary, so it's, it's zeros and one. Um, so if you want to express a large number in binary, it becomes silly long. I mean, the 65,536 is 16 ones in a row. And that's not very convenient for humans to read. So uh, like a, a way to find like a common ground, which is expressing uh, what the computer uh, is handling in binary with something that is more humanly readable. A, a, a fair trade off to this is the hexadecimal numbering system. Here you have 16 uh, symbols. Um, and so they are zero to nine, and then out of what, what is convenient, something where we know the, the range. So we, we added A to F for that. Uh, and the good thing is that computers, they use bytes. And if you take a half byte, that is four bits. And the maximum thing that you can express with four bits is 16. So hence, every four bit converts to a hexadecimal number because they can be from zero to 15. So 16 different items. Uh, so that means that uh, an eight bit uh, byte can convert into two hexadecimal numbers. And also, if you have a 16-bit range, of course, that then turns into four different hexadecimal numbers. Um, so it's, it's, it might feel unnatural if you haven't seen this before, but uh, trust me, when you have done this a number of years, hexadecimal is the way to go. If you want to mess with computers on the lowest level, hexadecimal is so much easier to read than decimal. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's not obvious if you're new to this, but, uh, and if this wasn't easy enough, watch this portion again and see if you get it, because uh, converting binary to something which is more humanly readable, hu humanly digestible, hexadecimal is a very, very good trade-off because like every symbol, matches to four binary bits. That's it. Okay, memory mapping on the Commodore 65. Now we get into the actual machine, the hardware configuration of the C64. And I've done an episode on memory maps on the C64 as well. So there will probably be a link in the description to this one, but uh, this is one of the kind of standard uh, matrices that have been shown in this context. So. The C64 has 64K of RAM. So the underlying part here, and here you can also see the addresses stated in hexadecimal. Uh, so they are between 00, 00, 00 and FF, FF. Uh, but the, the C64 does not only have RAM, it has ROM as well. And, and given that the computer, the CPU can only see 
64k. There needs to be some sort of mechanism to ensure that sometimes it sees ROM and sometimes it sees RAM. Otherwise the RAM wouldn't be accessible. And these are the three extra pin on the 6510 compared to the 6502. Those three pins generate a number of combinations where the memory map of the computer would be different. So if you have the, um, if you set them to, I think it's four, that means that you have all RAM. But if you set them to seven, then you have RAM, basic, RAM, IO, color RAM, and kernel. Uh, I would disagree that this is uh, this is actually it. The IO, the, I, I would say the color RAM is in the IO space, but it doesn't really matter. So the, the key takeaway is still that with a few pins of address one, which is internal to the CPU. It doesn't read, read the RAM from that address. It, it sets the pin for memory configuration. You can have, you can have the CPU see uh, one or the other of the banks it has in where they are overlaying. Okay, so if you want to code machine code, you need a place in the memory to place your code. And if we look back here, uh the first well you don't want to use zero page and and uh and and not the first the, the page after that and i will get back to that later but uh and then you have the screen memory and the default configuration so basic starts the the basic storage or the storage of basic program starts on 0800 so 0800 and then that one goes up until the address before a 0000 8000 uh, so you don't want to mess with that unnecessarily if you also try to mix in basic with your programs you could write a program in basic and then you add a machine code component to that. And if you look at the memory map, what, there is like one hole where there is all RAM and nothing else, but it's not accessible to basic. And that is the area between C1000 and D1000. So uh, if, well, if you see early machine code examples, they are almost always placed on C1000 because it's a convenient place. And if you want the very nice and even decimal number for that, it's 49152. Yeah, it's, it's unnatural. The hexadecimal way of addressing is a lot more easy or a lot easier. So put your stuff on C1000. Uh, until you say until you kind of get over a threshold and start finding your way around the memory map that's a very good way to start 49152 okay and and in order to code you also need to set up the environment um and well re depending on if you run this on linux or if you run it on on the c64 itself or if you run it from uh, from Windows or Macintosh, there are a number of different environments that are suitable for that. Uh, and I've done special episodes on that. So episode 16 and episode 29 are both sort of targeting this. Uh, I would go for the episode 29 because that is a newer one and it, it had refreshed contents over the episode 16. I should say that I use uh, Sublime, uh, which is a text editor, and then I use Kick Assembler, uh, which is an assembler for 6502. And then they are made into an IDE using like a glue made from made by Swoffa of noise. Um, very convenient. So you have syntax highlighting of the code, and uh, so you can tell already like it's it, it, it's a bit like pre-processing you see in color if what you've entered is valid code and what is valid data and what is valid strings and all of that it, it's so much easier than than assembling and then realizing you made a typo on the on the op code for a command Okay, yeah, we already went through this. So 16 bits address a lower and a higher part uh, and everything that is on the same page is called, well, some, same high byte is called a page. And page zero and one are special. Page zero is the zero page and, and page one is the hardware stack. 
in newer computers, the stack can be moved around so it could be anywhere. Uh, and, and some processes would even have so that if you have multiple threads, every thread would have an individual stack. But uh, but what a stack is doing is that when you when you need to store something temporarily, uh, you don't want to put it in the accumulator because you, you will do manipulations uh, somewhere else. But uh, a jump subroutine is, is calling a separate subset of, of your program. Uh, and then at the command RTS, return from subroutine, you need to remember, or the CPU needs to remember where it was when, when this, the subroutine was called. And, and what it does calling the JSR is that it pushes the return address to the stack. It's executing the subroutine, and when it hits an RTS, it fetches back those uh, addresses it pushed from the stack and put those in the program counter. That's that's how a JSR, a JSR works. And and of course, a stack is also one page, so you cannot make uh, 128 consecutive uh, JSRs because then you will run out of stack space, and it will start over uh, overwriting itself. Also a good thing to know, be, <laughs> the stack is also a scarce resource here. Okay, this is really complex, but in order to address, address places in the memory, um, or, or start ma doing manipulation in your code, uh, you could have the immediate addressing mode, and that is taking a value that you put after the instruction, and put that into the accumulator. So LDA means load accumulator. Hashtag means that it's immediate. And dollar means that it's hexadecimal. So uh, hex 10 is the value of 16. Uh, and you put that value into the accumulator. That's what that one is doing. Absolute means that you read from a memory address. Here, LDA1000 is, is stating to the CPU that you should go to address 1000 in memory and take those eight bits and put them in the accumulator. Absolute comma X is the same. So let's assume there is 10 in the, accumul uh, 10 in the X register. The LDA1000 comma X would fetch the eight bits that is on address 1010 and put that in the accumulator. Zero page uh, special dressing mode modes uh, in association with uh, the zero page. The instructions could be shorter because it only needs to kind of state the low byte of, of the page you're, you're seeking to dress here. So LDA 13 takes takes the 8 bit that is that are the, the ones that are stored on address 13 and copy that to the accumulator it's it's faster and it's shorter but but the zero page is really small so you can't store like massive parts of data it needs to be really essential the parts that you you use the zero page for um, but there are also addressing modes uh, comma x and comma y they are they work the same as the absolute comma x and comma y one thing to keep in mind is that uh, the zero page comma x that one wraps so it always reads an address on on zero page so if you if you two if you assume that x is one and you read from address ff comma x that sums up to address 100 and it cannot read from address 100 that will read from address zero it would like skip the highest part and only take the the low part, the low byte of that address. <clears throat> indirect, uh, yeah, it's it's of course the the absolute and the direct would be sort of the same. So indirect here, jump, uh, JMP is jump, jump to the address that is stored in address one thousand. So it's not jump to address one thousand, but it's fetching the address that is stored, the 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 two byte address that is stored in address one thousand. And then the, the really fussy part here is the indirect X and Y using zero page. Uh, I, I hope that my explanation here sort of covers it so you can also read it. Uh, so LDA inside of parenthesis uh, 10 comma X, where X is, 
let's say x is 6, that would read the 8 bits stored on address 16 to the accumulator. And you see also here that x is inside the, um, uh, the parentheses. Whereas indirect comma y, it's a different mode. So here it's, uh, it's taking the address that uh, address 10 points to. So let's, let's say that at address 10 and 11, uh, there is the value 1000 and y is six. Then it will read from address 1006. Uh, this might not be natural. And the difference here between X and Y is, is quite, quite difficult to understand at first. And, and this is probably also not the addressing mode you're going to use first. Uh, personally, I use the indirect comma Y a lot. When I make copy routines, um, you can use the zero page as pointing to where you want to read from and where you want to read to. And then you just make the, the uh, indexing using I. I, I rarely use the uh, LDA comma X here, um, zero page comma X. I don't really see the need for that. But uh, I mean, there are of course cases where that is convenient, but uh, the, the Y option is a lot more convenient. And then you have uh, other instructions. They are not using like normal addressing mode modes. Accumulator uh, ASL means arithmetic shift left. That takes the eight bits and then move them. So what was on bit zero uh, is on bit one. And the bit seven, the, the last bit or the highest bit, that one is moved into a carry register. So one of the bits in the, in the status register that we discussed before is used for that. RTS is returned from subroutine, it's implied. I don't know why it's called that, but that's it. And then, uh, then if you do compares and you want to do something that alters the running of the program, depending on this or that, I would like to go there or there. There is the branch uh, feature or the branch, branch command. Here it's branch or not equal, B-N-E. Uh, and they can only uh, be plus, uh, yeah, you, you can do 127 bytes forward and, and backwards. Uh, one is 128. I don't remember which one is which, but uh, so, but you, I mean, you never need to know this. You just type it into the assembler. And if you want to do a branch that is beyond that, the assembler will give you an error saying, no, oh, no, no, that's too far. You cannot jump that far. So branches are, so the value given after the branch, it's, it's relevant to the assembler to, that it's address 1000. But, but when you implement this in actual code, it's giving an index of its, uh, of which is only one byte. So it can only be 255. There will be more, there will be example code where I explain this a bit better, I hope. Okay, more on addresses. So here you have the same example as before. I just like to show you that the way things are stored here, which might not seem logical, is that if you if you watch address 1001, it's AD002000. That's load accumulator from address 2000. Here you see that they have the low byte first and then the high byte. Uh, the, the way we normally read numbers is that we take them from the biggest and then read them to the smallest. Uh, but this one is doing it differently. Uh, it's taking the low byte and then the high byte. It's 6502 works this way and, and it's just kind of getting used to. That's the way it is. So. And what I don't have here, but I also like to mention, when you code assembler, one of the absolute benefits is that you can give a logical reference and, and like a, a name reference to an address. So jump to address 2000. Yes, but if you if you and your code give address 2000 the name start, you can do a jump start and then that would be converted into the actual address in the assembly phase. But we will get to that as well. But that's also sort of relevant for this. Okay, so 
that's the computer, that's the memory configuration and addressing modes that the CPU can use. If you look at what the C64 has in addition, it, it has a number of chips that are doing a lot of things. The, the, you have a, a chip which is taking care of video. You have one chip that takes care of the sound. You have two timer chips that, that keep track of time and, and handle input and output. One of the features that the VIC chip has and the two timer chips, they, they also have that. It's the uh, interrupt request. So if you're running your program and suddenly the CPU gets an interrupt request, it will pause the, uh, the execution of the program where it was and it will start handling uh, an IRQ, an interrupt request. Um, and we will see a few of the examples later that shows this, but the VIC can do that based on raster interrupt. So a raster, think of, think of drawing the screen as like drawing it line per line. And here you can set the VIC to signal that I'm now on this line. So if you wanted to on, on address or line 30, when just before or just when the VIC starts drawing at uh, line number 30, it will trigger in interrupt to the CPU and then the CPU will treat that and handle that. And you do something that happens on that particular line. And, and that is absolutely vital for a number of things. If you would like to do like a picture on top and text at the bottom, which is kind of common in many games, a raster interrupt is used to find that particular line where you change from bitmap mode to character mode. Okay, and, and the C64 or the VIC has a feature of sprite. That is a, a little independent graphic object that can move freely uh, without uh, like colliding or, or messing with the graphics underneath. Uh, and, and if you have an area where there is no background and then it bumps in, so you, you kind of collide with the pixel, then you can have a sprite to background interrupt as well. And of course, if you have two sprites and they collide where, um, where one of the bits on the, on the sprite collide with one of the other bits on the other sprite, you will have a collision that is marked inside a register for both those sprites. There is a similar one for light pen. Uh, yeah, light pen, they weren't very successful on the C64, but, but it does work and, and uh, yeah, they can also trigger an interrupt. And the timer chip, the CIAs, they can also trigger based on the number of criteria. So you can set the timer to count down and, and uh, when it has counted down, it will trigger an interrupt. An interrupt is flagging to the, to the CPU that uh, there is an interrupt, please handle that. But it cannot enforce them. Uh, and then you have like the higher level of an interrupt, which is a non-maskable interrupt. The CPU cannot choose to kind of ignore it. It has to be handled. So the CPU is enforced to handle that particular interrupt. Uh, and if you're running a C64 standard, there is a timer interrupt that goes. And, and so on a regular interval, it checks keyboard uh, and updates uh, the time of day. I think that's what it's doing. So there, there is a running interrupt in the normal operation of a C64. It's not like an exceptional thing. It's a standard thing to have in your programs. Okay, so what, what now? If I want to start doing something, well, again, the notion here is that you should think of, of what you want to achieve as a big thing, but you cannot like write one line of code and it will do that. Uh, you need to break down your problem into lines of code. And if you do that in higher level languages, again, you can express what you want in, in rather few lines. But if you do it on in assembler, you need to break it down to loading and storing addresses to registers in the computer. Um, so you have a screen memory, 
Uh, either you can use the kernel's uh, print routines to put characters on there, or you poke directly into the screen memory, which is also absolutely fine. If you want to show a bitmap, or if you want to show a sprite, or anything else that is handled by the VIC, you poke areas or registers inside the VIC and tell it that that is what you want to do. So if you want to put the sprite on the screen, you need to tell where it is, uh, what color it has, um, if it's expanded or like normal size, if it's high resolution or multicolor, and also point out the memory area where the VIC can find the sprite data that you want to display. And we will get to that. Uh, and so, so that will be sprite and bitmap. And also, uh, if you have characters written on, on your screen, uh, you can change font very easily. You can just point the VIC to another font. So you load a font into memory and tell the VIC that, okay, these are the typography I would like to use. Uh, so what I have here is sort of a, a very, it's actually a very old example because it's a very old version of Vice. So what I have here is Sublime in the middle, the text editor where I have written a piece of code. I have assembled that using Kick Assembler, and, uh, and again the glue by Swoffa is, is making sure that I could just press F7. And then I have installed Vice, which is one of the potential emulators and the one I prefer to use, and I would say 95% of everybody use. Um, and what happens then is that the program is automatically fed to the emulator and, and uh, then you just run it there. Uh, so in the middle you see here, and I will tell you what the program is doing because uh, we will start looking into what programs actually do. So LDX is, I am setting a counter to X. And then you have a, a variable here, which is loop X. In Kick Assembler, the variables end with the, or, the, or the, sorry, the labels here, they end with a colon. Um, in, in other assemblers, the, you don't need the colon, but, uh, but for reasons, uh, this is how Kick Assembler expresses that. And then I should load accumulator from uh, the text tab comma x and text tab you see that down uh, at the lower part here, here. So it takes the first byte because x is zero, which so the first byte it reads is this zero e. Uh, and then it checks. What the, the, the value I just checked uh, that fetched was that zero. If it is zero, then you jump to end. If it's not zero, it's doing a jump to subroutine on FFD2. And this is the kernel routine for printing. Okay, so you have basic ROM mapped in, you have kernel ROM mapped in, which means that you can call the sort of service routines that are there. So you just need to read read up on all the potential routines in the on the kernel and and then the basic rom and then you can take advantage of them okay but so zero it wasn't zero because then it would have ended and it printed it increases the x register and then jump to loop x and it reads the next character here uh, and that is the eight and then it will do that take this part the text tab up until it reads byte zero because then the condition here branch on equal to end will be qualified and then it jumps to the this part the end here it does an increase so it inks uh, a memory address do20 and then it just immediately decreases that this is the border color so it's it's part of the vic the vic has uh, the addresses that start with d1000 and then upwards so what you see here is on the left uh, it increases the uh, the border color and then decreases it and given that it's doing this very fast you will have very thin lines where you increase and decrease and if you look at the uh, the disassembly, if I go into the machine code monitor of ICE, 
this is what my source code turned into. So this is the binary representation of that code here. And of course, it's uh, the last one is a byte zero. So, so it's up until this zero here. The rest is the garbage that is just in memory. Uh, I don't clear memory or anything. I just place stuff in memory and then I utilize the parts which is relevant to me. And the rest would be garbage still. So that's like the first piece of code. It prints hello world. That's the mandatory first test for a programming language. You should print something and you should say hello world. So this is doing hello world. Okay, next example. Now it's getting really tricky rather quickly because uh, um, I want to go down to, to something which is kind of educational here as well. So I place my code on C1000, I set the interrupt. So now I prevent interrupts from happening. So if they happen, they queue up, but I don't handle them. So I can prevent that. That's why they are interrupt request and not the non-maskable interrupts because they cannot be prevented. Uh, and then I load uh, 01 to accumulator and store that to DO1A. That tells the VIC that I would like to trigger raster interrupt. Okay, so this drawing of lines, that kind of an interrupt, I would like to have that. Uh, and then I tell the VIC that I would like that to happen on address line FB. I just picked a line. It's it's low in the in the very lower part of the screen. And then there is a register here that is DO19. Uh, that one is flagged uh, when the interrupt happens. And you need to clear it by writing stuff to it. And this is a convenient way of doing it. This is sort of if you if you think some of this is black magic, that is sort of the black magic of this. You just do that and then don't ask, it's just the way you do it. And in order to ensure, because there is like only one channel uh, or one vector that is called for interrupt, and then you need to decide wh what interrupts are there. Was this a timer interrupt or was it the light pen interrupt or was it something else? What, what you typically like to do then is to ensure that you cancel out all the sources you don't want. So you just set the ones you want and the, the rest should be disabled. So setting the VIC interrupt to just the raster interrupt, that eliminates all the other potential VIC sources. And what this does here is this it's terminating the timer interrupt. So this is this is ensuring that the timer interrupt isn't or the, the timer chips aren't sending in the interrupt request to the CPU because we don't want them for this. And then uh, the the interrupt service routine inside the kernel, the one of the system chips then uses a vector on 0314 and 0315. <clears throat> So what you do then is set the address that you would like to be called when an interrupt happens. Normally you need to push the content of A, uh, so the, the register, to ensure that they are retained from when, this, when the interrupt code is running. Um, so and that and that's the beauty of doing it like this because if you use the kernel routine the kernel would take care of the pushing and all of that you don't need to worry about that you would once it has done the mandatory parts then you get to take over via this vector uh, and then it clears the interrupt so now interrupts can happen but and the interrupts that will happen are the roster interrupts on address fb and when they happen, they will call the address that has the label of IRQ. And what, what do we do here? Well, we increase the background color and then we wait until we are on the, ad, on, uh, on the roster address FF. So they, the roster address here, FB, is when the roster interrupt happens. Inside the interrupt, we wait until address uh, or raster line FF, and then we decrease the DO20. So you would get a bar, and you see what it looks like on the right already. And then we 
re-trigger to ensure that Vic is ready for the next interrupt. And then we call EA31, and that is the, the kernel routine for finishing off uh, a roster interrupt. EA31 is the full routine that also scans the keyboard and all of that. So uh, you will see here in a second. So this is going to address C1000. So here you see the raster bar. It starts on ad on on raster line FB, and it uh, the duration is until raster line FF. And since the uh, I am doing sort of the normal service routine for for raster or for interrupts, I can the 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 keyboard still works because I'm calling EA31. That includes the keyboard service routine. So here every 50 seconds because this is a pal machine or every 60 seconds if you will run the very same piece of code on an ntsc machine you check the uh, the keyboard as normal and you can write and do whatever you want so you can have you can write uh print pontus uh 20 go to 10 and then i could do run so you have that and you still see the bar down here because so Basic, it's running a basic program that is doing that. And the interrupt breaks the, or or halts the execution of the basic program, drawing the line and then returning to normal operation. So this is taking a fraction of the CPU time. Most of the time is still uh, wasted printing Pontus on the screen. Okay, so that was that. Um, the next one is a sprite. Uh, I will execute that here and we will. Uh... So let's go through what, what things are, what, what this does. It, it's taking data from sprite and copy it to address 03C0. 03C0 and it's doing that and here i do a computation so a sprite is 21 characters high or lines high and it's three bytes wide so the the, the pixel data here is three bytes which means 24 pixels wide and then 21 pixels high uh, so i just compute that so it's 63 bytes and and i copy them down to this magical error uh, area down in the lower memory this is the tape buffer and, and uh, unless you're right using uh, tape loads this is sort of a safe area to store a uh, few sprites on uh, what I do then is poke 70 in D1000 D and D1001. That is the X and Y register of, uh, of a sprite. Uh, so that's positioning the sprite. And then I need to tell the Vic where to look for the data. So I copy the data to somewhere. I need to tell Vic where it is. And this is what I do here. Uh, this is sort of the tricky part when uh, when you're messing with sprites because the the pointers to where sprites are in memory they are uh, the very the eight last bytes of an area that is normally allocated for the current screen memory. So the screen memory is from 0400 up until 07FF or 0800. But but the actual screen is only to uh, to O seven E eight. So the, the the rest of the bytes there are available, and the Vic uses them uh, the last eight of them for pointers to sprite data. This is the part that takes you the longest when messing with sprite, understanding where to set the sprite pointers. Uh, and then DO15 is the register for turning sprites on and off. And there are eight sprites, which means that every bit of DO15 can turn a sprite on and off. So, uh, and this is, uh, if I'm using the lowest sprite, sprite zero here, the, the one would enable that sprite. So, here we go. So, 
I don't know if you can see it, but here is FLT. And if you see here, the pattern here, it's F, L, and T, which is what you have here. I can, can I clear the screen or no? Ah, yeah. So this is, I just show it here and this is the emulator where I'm but if I do like this, you can see that the FLT is still there and the sprite works totally independently of the rest of the graphics. So it's just sitting there in address 70, both in X and Y position. And it's uh, it doesn't care what you do with the characters underneath it. You can set a priority. So this one goes in front or behind the, the characters you see on screen. And, and you can also set up the interrupt for the sprite so that if, if they're is a collision between this and the characters, then you would have an interrupt that is triggered. All right, so that's one piece of code. Uh, yeah, the next one is, uh, I'm not saying these are the perfect examples, but here I'm using AB1E, which is a routine inside basic to print the string. Uh, and the string you see here, uh, it this one is for clearing screen so intro is the text string here and then it prints c for color u for upper l for lower and then it's doing a carrier carriage return and then uh, it's the marking the end of the string with a zero and and the ab1e is very handy way of exp of uh, printing a routine or print printing a, a little string of text to the screen it can only be 256 bytes so th there are limits to this but uh, if you're printing something which is really short that's the very very efficient way to do it and then key press, I jump to subroutine to FFE4. That is the routine that checks the, the keyboard or checks if there is stuff in the keyboard buffer. So the IRQ puts stuff in the keyboard buffer and then you call FFE4 and that fetches stuff from the keyboard buffer. And BEQ here means that what this routine returned if that was zero, then check for another. Because if you did uh, zero, means that no, there was no key in the buffer. So, uh, and then you just call it and call it and call it and call it. And here is compare with 43. If it's not 43, it should jump to this. And this is, uh, I'll go through that. And then it compares with 55. And if it's, not, if it's not 55, it's going here, it's comparing with 43. And if it's not that, it, go back, it goes back to key press. So 43 is the character C, 55 is the character U, 4C is the character L. So for color, for upper or for lower case. Uh, this is a little special thing because finding new unique labels gets to be a bit tedious. So jump to the next one and, and uh, I don't mind naming it. I, it. I don't need to call it something. So um, an exclamation mark here and then so go to the next label that is an exclamation mark. Plus here means jumping forward. Uh, if I would have an exclamation mark minus, it would go to the previous one. And I think you can stack the pluses so it would jump to two, uh, excla uh, two exclamation mark uh, label forward and backwards. But, but so you don't have to find silly label names. The exclamation mark is a quick way in the assembler. This has nothing to do with the machine code because this is converted into machine code and, and uh, then the that this little trick in the assembler isn't isn't visible. Okay, so um, yeah, let's let's run that. I have that here on my screen as well. Um, there. Okay, so this is upper. You have two character modes on the sixty four. One is upper and lower. The other one is upper and graphics. So this is starting with uh, with upper. If, then I can switch to lower. So I press U, L, U, L, 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 U. So what my program is doing here is 
if I press U, it prints 8E. So it if U is, is true, it doesn't skip here. It goes to this. It's load accumulator with UE and doing an output. An output is printing to FFD2. That is the print of a character. And then it go back to fetch another key press. If I press L, it fetches the same value, uh, another value, it's uh, zero E, and then feed that to the print routine. And uh, yeah, yeah, and here, oh, I forgot to, here, if I press C, it will increase DO20. So it increases the background color. It's a silly example, but it kind of shows what you can do here. Right. And yeah, yeah, what is this? That's code example five. So it's <laughs> this is this is probably going to take some time to digest. I set the interrupt to ensure that I don't get any interrupts while this is happening. And then I take the DO12, which is the line that the, the raster line that the CPU is current or the VIC is currently drawing. And then I logically shift that to the right, which, and this basically means divide by two. So divide by two, divide by two, divide by two. Uh, which turns to be divide by eight, right? So two, four, two, four, eight. Uh, that means that the rows here are eight pixel rows high. And then I store the value of this into DO20. And then I also do a little fiddling here, uh, masking and, and um, masking, uh, well, taking away everything except the lowest three bits and, and then add C to that. So um, that means that the end result could be something between C0 and C7. And then I store that in DO16. That is the fine scroll register. You can move the screen right to left um, one pixel at the time. And this is what you set on the lowest three bits of DO16. So that's why you see this sort of curvage. Uh, yeah, it's, it, it looks really ugly, but it was a quick thing. And, uh, and then I have jump to exclamation mark minus. Again, the convenient way of addressing something without giving it a proper name. As you can see, it's flickering. So this is not usable for anything. It's just uh, showing a bit of graphics on the screen that does something else than just printing. Uh, and yeah, I had another code example, but I didn't have a picture for that. Uh, yeah, let's do that here. Oops, uh, let's try again. Okay, so my code example here, this is uh, this is adding a bit of more complexity as well. So uh, 3C00, uh, picture, I import a picture in C64 format uh, to this location in memory. And then my routine is at 6400. And there are reasons why it is like this, because uh, the, the picture ends here on uh, 63E8, I think. So that, that's basically the first free page. And then I take uh, the memory areas from 3C00 and copy them to D800. So a picture or, or a bitmap picture on the C64, a multicolor bitmap, consists of three parts, the screen memory, the color memory, and the bitmap. Both the screen memory and the color memory are used to reference a character or, or reference a color. Uh, so uh, the, the screen is addressed by the VIC directly, whereas, and, and, and I can point to a place in the memory where that is, whereas the color memory is always on D800. So I need to copy the data to D800 for that to, to be there. So it loads them 
Uh, the bitmap part is is already here on address 4000, and uh, and then the 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 screen is on address 6000, and then the first free one is on 6400. So that's where my code is. So this is a big copy routine that copies 256 bytes. This one, so 3300, x, and then I do 3D and 3e and 3f so i copy four different pages to the color memory that's filling the color memory i set 3b in do 11 that is telling vic that i would like to view bitmap i do d8 to do 16 that is telling the vic that i would like to have a multicolor bitmap there is a high risk bitmap as well but this is multicolor bitmap and then the, the CPU can see the full 64K, but the VIC can only see one of four banks. So it can only see 16K. And here I tell it that I would like to see bank, the, the second bank, the one that goes between 4,000 and 8,000. And then I tell it that the bitmap is at uh, 4,000 and the screen is at 6,000. So this is, uh, and I express that in binary. Ah, that's actually wrong. It should be like that. Uh, yes, like that. So this is telling, uh, it would be the same actually in, <laughs> in hex. I was lucky when I, when I did that typo. And then I also tell it that I would like the background color to be uh, black because that is what the, the, the color of the picture is. So let's see if I run that. Uh, uh, and then I run that. And I go into my machine code monitor and call it here. So here we go. Knights and Slime World Selector. That is the picture from the game Knights and Slimes. Um, I just... I played the game, I pressed the freeze button, and in my action replay, there is an option to save the current bitmap. And then I save that out, and that's the way it looked. And now you also, and in, uh, uh, ooh, what was the name? I should know the uh, image studio, image system. Yeah, I think it's image system is the format I used. and. So the action replay here is very nice to you. It saves things out in formats and you can select the format, which means that if you just know one picture or one picture format by heart and, and image system is the only one I know by heart, it's, it's easy to write the piece of code that does particularly that. Um, if you have something like Koala Painter, they stack the uh, so you cannot just load it and show it you need to copy also the screen memory to proper location but uh, yeah i didn't need to do that all right uh that was a few examples so where do you take it from here well first of all uh there is no way you can be good at coding if you don't code so <sighs> Set yourself a number of targets, and and I just given a few examples, and I know that uh, that a, a few of those I've already done for you, but uh, you should do them yourself to ensure that you are aware how it's done, because then you can do it yourself, not just copy what I just written. So print a string on the screen. That's a good way to start. Uh, place a sprite on the screen, and I know understanding the Vic is quite difficult, but once you get a hang of it, it's quite logical. Well, once you have the sprite there, start reading a joystick or, or reading a keyboard and, uh, and then start moving the sprite around uh, so you can actually control the sprite. And adding to that, also set up a raster interrupt. And should, well, first of all, you can do the, you can check the keyboard or the joystick based on the raster interrupt to ensure that you check it on a regular basis. <laughs> But also see if you can manage to get the sprite to hit stuff. P place two sprites and have them collision and see what the interrupt is doing. And, and have one sprite collide with, with characters you put on the screen and see what happens. And then show a bitmap picture, of course. That could be another project. And uh, do a soft scroller. Have a little row of text that runs across the, uh, the lower part of the screen. 
try to play a tune. Uh, most of the tunes um, you would you would call the first address of the tune, let's say address 1000, and you have a zero in the accumulator and you call it, and that is setting that subtune. Some some pieces of, of, of music would have multiple uh, tunes in them. So you, then you set um, a, a one to the accumulator and call the init routine, and then it will start playing the, 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 the second tune or, or the third tune or whatever. And then you call an IRQ the the play in every IRQ. So once every 50 or 60 seconds, you call the music routine, and then it will play stuff in the in the SID to ensure that something is heard in the in the in the speakers. And then you try to combine all that. So you have a bitmap with a scroller, and then you play music. That is a challenge. Let's see if you can do that. Another thing, Sprite Scroller. That was cool. That's one of the projects I started doing. I was showing a bitmap and then I had a Sprite Scroller and I didn't move the sprites, which is one way to do it. I shifted the content of the bits. So I just had a static array of sprites and then I shifted the content, but you can do either way. Both of them works fine. Uh, and then the next idea here would be to have uh, explore the Victrix. You have the static border that it's supposed to be there and the Commodore engineers put it there and had no idea it could be removed. But there are tricks to remove the upper and lower border. And if you want to learn how to do that, then have a look at episode 40 because I'm going through a bit of that. And then put the sprite scroller in the border, because now that the border is open, you can put sprites there and you can, of course, put a sprite scroller in the border. Um, yeah, and, and another example here would be a multiplexer. The, the, this, the Vic can only show eight sprites, but the cool thing is with roster interrupts, if you have one roster interrupt on one line and another roster interrupt on another line, you can move the set of eight sprites between the two areas. And suddenly you have 16 sprites on the screen. The only restriction is you can only show eight sprites at a time. But as long as the a sprite has stopped showing, you can reuse it uh, at the lower position. So the same sprite could be visible. Sprite number zero can be visible multiple times over the screen. And one of the things I would strongly encourage you to do is take a look at old demos and see how they do it. Um, and and here I would like to recommend the C64 debugger or retro debugger. So what you see here on the screen is the disassembly on the right. You see a memory map what what content is on uh, on each of the addresses here. And then you see a hex dump of memory, and then you see the screen of a Fairlight intro, and um, yeah, and the lower right is an interpretation as sprite and as font of that particular memory memory, memory area. There are multiple modes in C64 Debugger. It, the, the threshold for using it is rather steep, but uh, you do you press Control and one of the F keys, or Control Shift and the F keys, and it shows a number of like static screens that interpret the C64 memory or disk drive memory in different ways. And there is also like a, a music player routine and, and, uh, and also uh, like a Vic editor. So you can actually edit the screens inside this as well. If you want to poke with a running program, you can easily do it here. I would absolutely like to recommend C64 Debugger for taking a look at other people's code and see how they do their tricks. The next thing would be books. So the, the books I used myself is this, Programming the 6502. I was lazy, so I even had the Swedish translation of this because my native language is Swedish. Uh, Rodney Sachs, he, he wrote also the Z80 book. So if, if you want to learn both CPUs, uh, he would have written both of the best books or the best book for both platforms. Uh, so, so that is the CPU, but 
understanding where to the, all the addresses of the Vic and the Sid and, and the timer ships and, and uh, what the kernel is doing and all of that. This is the book I'm using myself. So I have that here. This one contains all the reference you need. This is, uh, I, I use this so much, it's it's silly. I, I really couldn't live without this. This is, if I would have a fire and I would save one book, this is the book I would save because they are very hard to find. But uh, again, you can get a soft copy. I, I prefer the hard copy, That's, I'm an old fashioned guy. So it has a full disassembly of both the kernel and the basic. So if you want to see all the instruction with comments, what every line of code inside the basic and kernel is doing, it's in this book. Another another good one, which is used by a lot of people. There is no disassembly in this one, but mapping the C64 is by Sheldon Lehman is uh, is also a great book explaining what all the ad uh, addresses in the C64 is doing and uh, giving a number of examples and all that. So it's 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 a great book. I prefer this if I can only have one, but of course I have that one as well. This one is is a bit different because uh, I mean the disk drive is also a CPU uh, or or a computer. It has a 6502, not the 6510. It has a 6502. It has 2K of memory, and it has a massive kernel that is uh, used for all the service routines for addressing the disk. And if you want to program the disk drive, and I know we're not really there if you are watching this as like the first way into machine code. But just know that there is an evolution path. Once you think that you have man managed to master the computer, you can also master the disk drive. That was everything for this week. Um, thank you so much for watching. And let's see if I can swap to this. Yes, thank you so much for watching. And Please do me a little, little, little bit of favor. Share this with somebody who could be even the remotely interested in programming on the C64 or, or kind of programming on old machines in general. Because uh, if you want, if you seek to program on the PC, an old PC in assembler or or the Amiga or whatever machine, the principles are the same. The addresses are different. The kernels are different, and and all of that. But the general principle of the CPU and the memory and uh, the internal addressing of that, that is sort of the same. So if you grasp the, the general concept, you can easily take that onwards towards another platform. So I could have done very much the same just with Amiga source code. And I would show you hardware reference manual, which is sort of this for Amiga. Basically the same. So. Do share with somebody. Do me the favor of sharing this with somebody. And I will promise you that I will try to make more episodes for you. If you have any questions, there are a number of people ready to help you with, with your coding deeds. So feel free to post here if you have any questions or if you have this little 10 lines of code and you can't really imagine what is going wrong. I'm sure a number of people are ready to help you and I can even do that for you. Thank you so much for watching and see you next week. Bye bye.